the title of this message today is uh, Poverty, Poverty in the You at the Arada Church. I don't know who put that title together there, but it doesn't matter. But uh, you, us, in this church family and poverty, how do we deal with it? Why do I talk about it? Why is it even import, important? You know, how do we approach it? I think it's a huge issue. I am looking in this sermon series at some of the issues that uh, people find to be very important. Younger generation of people, they are looking at the worldwide poverty. And for them, this is an issue. This is a major issue. And I want us to look at how we're going to approach this as Christians. And uh, before I talk about this, I'm going to say this. You all know what I'm going to say before I say it because you heard me speak for 20 years. And uh, you have heard every sermon imaginable out of my mouth. And you know I'm, by the time it's all said and done, I'm going to say we need to be generous and we need to do things for the poor. But before that, uh, I, before that, I want us to understand that I presume, I assume that everybody knows and has common sense. What Bible says here, somebody laughed at it. <laughs> well, let's, let's do have common sense. What the Bible is talking about here is about helping those who are genuinely poor. There are people who are taking advantage of the system. There are people who are lazy. There are people who don't care to learn how to manage their money. There are people like that. And I'm assuming that you're not just going to go out and throw your money at somebody like that. You may have a cousin who never has money for rent or who never has money for car payment or, you know, and it's always the same story. And I'm not talking about that. I'm assuming you have enough common sense that you're not going to do that. But there are those who are in genuine poverty, and I think this, has, uh, this puts us on a spot as Christians and tests our relationship with God. I'm going to go through a number of texts, and then we are also going to look at some uh, sayings that people have said and so on. So the first text that I have here is found in Luke, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And uh, I chose this first because this is from Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. God's Spirit ha has anointed Jesus to do the following. To proclaim the good news to the poor. He didn't say to everybody. He said to the poor. You know, we are all poor in a sense. Poor in our understanding of God. Poor in our relationship with God. Poor in our knowledge of the Bible and God's will for us. So in a sense, we are all poor. But Jesus came here to proclaim the good news, the, the liberty, the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. There are people in here who may be captives. Captives of sin. There are people in here who may be blind. Blind to what's going on around them, blind to their own soul, blind to their own character, blind to their own actions. You know, we always tend to see ourselves in the good light and always judge other people, you know. But Jesus says, I've come to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And I'm going to present to you that we are all oppressed. Our enemy, Satan, is trying to oppress every single one of us, trying to get us to go down the wrong path, trying to get us to hate, to doubt, uh, to get away from God's teachings of mercy and kindness, trying to harden our hearts so that we would be judgmental of others. But Jesus says, I've come to set you at liberty, and I have come to proclaim the year of Lord's favor. They, and that last sentence there tells me that if I ask for God's favor, if I ask for God to help me overcome uh, any kind of bad thing in my life, whether it's selfishness or jealousy or anger or bad words or whatever it may be, uh, envy, there is all kinds of things that Satan sneaks into our hearts that separate us from God. But Jesus says, come, I come to proclaim the year of God's favor if you ask for help. 
If you ask for liberty, if you ask for freedom, he's going to give that to you. He wants us to be like he is. That's the point of this whole message. Jesus wants you and I to be like he is. So those are the simple points there. Proclaim liberty, recovery of sight, set free those who are oppressed, and proclaim God's uh, favor. And this is not just what Jesus came to do for us, but this is also what we as a church are supposed to do around the world and in our neighborhood and with each other. So that's why I said poverty and, and you and I, how are we going to relate to this? How is this going to affect us? So now if you go one, one verse further to James, James says in uh, James 2, 14 to 17, he says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone, he, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Now, James is writing to the church and he's judging them. This is a judgment on us now. Jesus was saying, I've come to free you. James is saying, hey, wait a minute. What good is it if you say you have faith? In other words, what good is it if you say you're a Christian? What good is it if you say I follow Jesus? What good is it if you say I know my Bible? What good is it if you say I can recite Psalm 23 and the Ten Commandments? What good is that, he says, if someone says I have the faith, but no works? And then he asks a question, can that faith save him? If a brother, and then he uses an example of what he's talking about. If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, there are a person or two right now in this congregation, right now, who are lacking in daily food. I can tell you that with certainty because I have talked to them. And we may not be aware of that, but they are here. And that's why I said poverty and you. So what we do in this church, we put money into our food bank and we put money into our needy fund so that people like that can be helped. But there are some right now in this congregation who tell me, hey, Gordon, you know, I'm down on food. So he, that's what he says. If a brother or sister, they're poorly clothed, the winter is coming here in Denver, and they are lacking in daily food, and you say to them, hey, go in peace. Be warmed up and filled. In other words, see you later, alligator. Right? Everything is going to be fine. Or another one favorite of mine is what, and we all tend to do this. Oh, I'm going to pray for you. Right? We say that. Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself. In other words, religion by itself. I have a certificate on my wall that I was baptized. And I have another one that I've got a degree in religion from a seven-day Adventist institution. But religion by itself that does not have good works is dead. That's what James says. Is dead. So two things we learn from this verse. Faith without good works is no good and cannot save us. Number one. And number two, do not ignore those who are poor and who are in need. The easiest thing is to ignore. Again, I say use your good judgment. I'll give you an example. By uh, 120th there in Sheridan, Home Depot, and I go there. I went there quite a bit in the last few weeks trying to fix things on my house before the winter comes in. And there is a guy standing on, sitting on the corner and he has a, a toddler crawling around the sidewalk and a bunch of stuff all over the grass there on the sidewalk, on the corner as you go into the, into the Home Depot, you know. And I, as I was driving in there the other day, a policeman came over and told him to put the, to, to put the baby into a stroller. He couldn't crawl on the... But they couldn't tell him to, uh, not to do this, not to beg. But he professionally begs. Day after day, after day, after day, after day, weeks and months and 
never looking for a job. You know, there are people like that. I'm not talking about that. There are people who will take advantage of you. I don't know how many stories have I heard. And it's always the same story. Pastor Gordon, uh, I'm driving to Utah and my car broke down and I need a new transmission. And we just need a little bit of help. And then the same voice forgets that they called my number and called me again in three days and same story. You know, so I'm not talking about it. You have to use your common sense. But when we experience those kind of people, then we tend to ignore everybody. That's not good either. We can't do that either because there are those who have a genuine need. Mother Teresa said, let's see, when a poor person dies of hunger, it has not happened because God did not take care of him or her. It happened because neither you nor I wanted to give that person what he or she need, needed. And I don't want to put the guilt trip on us here. That's not the point. I just want us to develop a systematic approach to having a relationship with God. A part of that relationship with God is to do what we can within our means to help somebody who is in poverty. Because God is testing us. He's testing us to see if we have the heart of Jesus or if we have the heart of selfishness. I don't want to help anybody. I don't want to do nothing for nobody else. I put there a few pictures, you know, throughout this sermon. I mean, I don't need to put pictures. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You have seen it yourself. Just go online and you can look, you know, Asia and South America and Africa and parts of Europe and Russia, North Korea, Denver, Colorado, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, go to anywhere and you will find uh, poverty and suffering and lack of everything. Back in Deuteronomy, we have a verse in uh, chapter 15 where God from the earliest days, this is now 3,000 3, years ago, God is saying to the nation of Hebrews as he's trying to put them together into a nation. He says, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you. God commanded them, Israelites. You shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. Deuteronomy 15, 11. And this is a fact of life, you know. We are going to have this always amongst us. Always. There is never going to be a time when uh, there is no poverty in this world. I lived in a communist country, you know, and they said, we're going to make everybody equal, you know. And they took away land from people in houses, those people who had a little bit more, you know. But by the time they were done, said and done, you know, in those 60 or 70 years that communism was ruling, there was a lot of poor people in there. A lot of poor people in there. So you cannot put together any system on this planet that's going to eliminate poverty. The Bible says it's always going to be amongst us and therefore be generous. Now, the next point. Mahatma Gandhi, some of you know, you know who he was. He was a leader of India. There are people in the world so hungry that God cannot appear to them except in the form of bread. We are planning in this church, for example, our other church, we are talking to a few preachers to come in and do some Bible seminars, you know, on, on uh, the things that we usually as a church do, end of days and, you know, revelation and all of that stuff. And a lot of Adventist churches are doing that. And we do that, you know, we do that, and we do Bible studies in our church, in a Seventh-day Adventist church. And we teach people about the Sabbath, and we teach people about the Ten Commandments, and we teach people about following Jesus, because we want to baptize them, and we want them to become Seventh-day Adventists. When I was in Indonesia last year, uh, we baptized 40 or so kids that went to our Seventh-day Adventist Academy there. And I showed you pictures, it's a poor place. And a lot of those kids that we baptized, they were either 
from a Muslim family or from a Lutheran family. Lutherans came to Indonesia long before anybody else. So a lot of people are Lutheran. And those kids were baptized. And some of those kids came to me. You know, it was interesting. The first few days that I was there, the, the principal said, Pastor Gordon is going to be in this classroom. And if any of you kids want to go talk to him, you can. First day, nobody came. They were all shy. Second day, a few kids came. By the time the week was over, there was a line of kids waiting to talk to me, you know. And they all were coming from poorest of the poor family. They all were accepted into that school based on uh, the generosity of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And their tuition was covered. They were struggling with food, a lot of them. Just a bad situation. And a lot of those kids told me, Pastor Gordon, I want to be baptized, but if I do that, my family is going to disown me because my family is Muslim. Or my family is Lutheran, even worse, and they don't want me to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And later on, you know, as before I left, I talked to a conference president, and I said, you don't need to put money into evangelism. All you need to do is put money into schools. More schools. Yeah. Open more schools. Provide food for the kids, you know, tuition. And uh, you're going to have more people accepting the, our gospel and the Jesus than ever. Exactly what he said. Jesus, he took care of people's needs. Somebody was hungry, he said to his disciples, let's feed them. If somebody was hurt, Jesus tended to their illness. Opened the eyes of the blind. Went to the nursing homes to visit those who were sick. We have nursing homes here in Denver. Went to the hospital. Went out onto the streets. Our van that we got is going to go out on the streets. I hope we start by once a week and then by twice a month and then four times a month and maybe ten times a month. I don't know. We have a stove in there. And maybe as the nurses are looking after the wounds of the people who are living on the streets, maybe on that stove, like you said, Kim, there is going to be a pot of warm soup for somebody to eat on a cold, wintry day in Colorado. That's what I want us to do as a church. I want us to participate in making this world a better place to alleviate the suffering here in our community. And I'm not, uh, we're not requiring a lot. We are already, I'm already thrilled with what we got from this church, from you as, as members of this church that are making all of this happen. So that's where we are going as a church. So God, Gandhi said there are people in this world so hungry that God cannot appear to them except in the form of bread. You can talk to them till you're blue in the face if you don't take care of their stomach they're not going to hear anything else you have to say. Frank uh, Butchman said, There is enough in the world for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. And I can show you pictures of rich people. I can show you pictures of poor people. It doesn't matter. I mean, you get the message, right? The world is not a fair place. There are some who, and I'm going to show you one chart here in a minute when we get to it where you see a small percentage of the people controlling the vast amounts of wealth on this planet, while others are basically, but we're not going to solve that. Not until Jesus comes. But I can do my five bucks. I can do my cup of coffee for somebody. My bottle of water. My old shirt that's sitting in my closet for years and years and years and not warming up anybody. Just wasting my space. That's what I can do. First Timothy 6. You guys okay with going through all of these texts? Are you getting bored? You won't go home? No? no? Want to do some more? Yes. I just want to check. I don't want to hold you here against your free will. <laughs> yes. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. And I asked in the morning, what does that word mean, haughty? High-minded? What does it? Give me some more. 
What does it mean? Narcissistic. Narcissistic. Proud. Proud. Okay. So, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be all of that, haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Sometimes, as human beings, we get kind of satisfied with what we got and we think that that's going to protect us in case of a trouble. And I'm telling you, next time when there is a, and I don't want to go into politics here, but everything that I'm looking at, I believe that there is going to be another crash here in this country, financial, and next time that happens, no amount of riches is going to protect anybody. And all of us in here can find ourselves in this group of poor people that we are talking about how to help how to help them now. We could be somebody who needs help. And I believe it's going to happen. Maybe a year, maybe two, but I believe it's going to happen. So he says, do not put your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good. Who? The rich people. Well, who is the rich people? Well, you and I, folks. We got more money in this room than some countries have put together. You know, you and I, we are the most prosperous people in the world in this country, in the United States of America. We make more per capita. We make bigger paychecks and bigger salaries than anybody else in the whole world. My dad, when he was alive, he come here and I take him out to eat to McDonald's, you know, and we would grab a couple of sandwiches, you know, and he would ask me, how much was that? And I would tell him it was $12, you know, and then he would convert that into the Croatian money. And he would say, are you crazy? You're spending this much money on two sandwiches, you know? You laugh because you do the same thing, right? <laughs> we don't even know how much money we get coming through our wallets and fingers all the time, you see. So he says, they or us, we are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus doing what? Storing up treasure. Where? In heaven. In heaven. Amen. For themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. I mean, look at the truth that he's saying here. He's saying, you guys need to understand that this life is just a test. You know, like you're listening to the radio and all of a sudden you hear that boom, boom, zzz, stop, whatever, and it says this is a test of the national weather. Yeah. It's just a test, not the real thing, right? Yeah. Now, it's on our phone. now it's on our phone. We get a it's just a test. So this life is just a test. It's not the real thing. But the real thing is coming. And if I, you and I want to be ready for the real thing, we need to store the treasure in there. And that treasure is what? Don't be proud. Don't trust in riches. Hope in God. Be rich in good works. Sharing. When you share with others, that's storing points in heaven. Every time you share something with others, that God, God knows. God sees. God takes that into account. God looks at you and says, okay, I see. Doesn't have to be a lot. Does, it can literally be a bottle of water. I was in Florida driving and a guy was begging on the side of the street and he looked like he really could use some help and I didn't have any cash in, on me but I had an unopened bottle of water and I, as I drove by, I stuck it out of the window and he just grabbed it and said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And be a bottle of water. What does that cost me? Ten cents? And true life is eternal life. That's what the Bible teaches now we go next to, let's see, after the picture of that uh, beautiful Rolls Royce, we go to 1 Timothy 3, 16 to 18. All mine, right? <laughs> first, uh, let's see, what did I say? 1 Timothy, 1 John 3, 16 to 18. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us. So see how he's setting this up? He wants, John wants to put the big guilt trip on everybody who is listening. Jesus laid down his life for you. And what are you going to do? You're going to complain about having to help some needy person? And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. 
But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So, love is what? If Jesus put his life down for us, then love is a sacrifice. When was the last time, and I asked this question of myself too, when was the last time I gave something sacrificially? Meaning I took it away from me even though I needed it. That's a sacrifice. When you need something, you know, when, when sacrifice, when you have extra and you give it, I have two phones and I have an old one and a new one and I'm going to give you my old one because what am I going to do with two? That's not sacrifice. If I have 50 shirts and 10 of them I don't wear because they're either too big or whatever and I give you those 10, that's not sacrifice. Sacrifice is when you have one and you need it and you turn it over to somebody else. Now that's another level of giving, right? And I think that comes as a result of God's Holy Spirit in our heart. That's another level of spirituality. But if you close your heart, how does God's love abide in you? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. I would like us to be a church that does deeds together, where we participate. When Fred Harden was alive uh, some years ago, we went over there and painted his trailer. You all remember that. And somebody said to me, Gordon, how come we didn't do that anymore? And, and, and that's a good question. How come we didn't do that? That trailer park where, where Fred lived is still there. There are many trailers there that need painting. There are many elderly people there who need help. Maybe we'll go paint another trailer. Maybe we'll go build another ramp. That's right. That's exactly right. And that's what, as a church, we ought, to, we ought to be doing. Roosevelt, let's see, is it Roosevelt's time? Franklin D. Roosevelt. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. There are some people who are always going to have too little. And I, and I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get into this pol politics of this where we are saying let's tax one group so that another group. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about my personal responsibility. Out of my free heart, out of my free will. If somebody makes me give and help somebody else and forces me to do that, whether it's government or a church or whatever, and I don't do it out of my heart, then it's not going to be accepted by God as a good gift. So I'm talking about doing it because we want to do it. A couple of more texts that I think are very important. Now this is God speaking. We have Jesus speaking. We have John speaking. We have James speaking. Now we have God speaking. In Isaiah and then again in Micah. In Isaiah, God says, when you come to appear before me as we have done this morning, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Have you ever had somebody trample around your house? Come in and jump up and down on your couch and your kitchen table? Walk in with dirty boots, not take them off? Make a mess? I, there was a story online where this guy rented a house online to somebody only to come back a few days later and the house was completely destroyed. Somebody trampled all over it. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. In other words, God says I cannot endure when you sin and then you come to church 
God says, I can't, I can't stand it. When you do things that you know are wrong, and then you show up at church. He's basically saying, well, he's saying, I can't stand it. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. You know that God says a couple of times in the Bible that he hates his, their Sabbaths. Sabbath, you know, the day of rest, fourth command. Why does he hate it so much? They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. God says, you coming to church to worship me is a burden to me. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. What a horrible condemnation for God's people. God's, can you imagine God saying, I just hate you. I hate you. I can't stand you. I can't stand what you do. I don't want nothing to do with you. But he didn't say that, I don't want nothing to do with you. He comes back after saying all of that, and he says in verse 16 the following. Wash yourselves. Go take a big shower. Better yet, go take a bath. Better yet, go to Glenwood Springs and soak for a whole day. Until all of the stuff is washed away. You know. Make yourselves clean. Remove what? The evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease. Stop doing evil. And I'm going to make a case here. That ignoring poverty and hardening our hearts is evil. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression. Think, you know, I'm going to throw a word out here that some of you may not like. Activism. Are we supposed to be activists as Christians? Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression. But no, we are not. We are so dead and we stay away from all of that stuff. We just focus on the Sabbath. No. No, God says, do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. So we do have a role in the society. We do have a role in the church. We do have a role to, to fulfill in our relationship with God. How many of you have seen this story where this couple, of um, uh, a mother and the stepfather killed her 10-year-old after for years they tortured him in California. And the reason why this story is so depressing and so disgusting is because social services came into the house more than 80 times and the boy still remained in there. And the last time when they came, he was dead. Received beatings after beatings after beatings after beatings. Picked him up, threw him down on his head. Now they are facing the death penalty. But there was nobody. There was no social services. There was no preacher. There was no cousin. There was no relative. There was nobody to stand up for that little boy. Nobody. We have a role, folks. We do have a role. Sometimes standing up for somebody else is joining us on a street beat ministry. Sometimes helping somebody else is bringing you some extra food that you have at your house you're not going to use and leaving it at our food bank. Sometimes standing up for somebody else is bringing in some decent clothes that is still pretty good so we can pass it out. Sometimes that means to take your kids and teach them how to be generous to other people. Or maybe even better yet, send them on a mission trip so they learn and see 
what's going on in the rest of this world. Bring no vain offerings, God says. I cannot endure your Sabbaths. I hate your religious holidays. I will turn away from you unless you cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, and be just to the poor. That's what God says. I told you I was going to show you this one slide on global wealth. I don't know, can you see that good? By the way, uh, can you, with these slides, do you see them good? Usually? Because we are really looking at maybe getting a different projector for in here. Every once in a while I hear people that they can't tell. So when you look at the total wealth, you have 1% of the people at the very top, they are holding 41% of all of the wealth on this planet. And on the bottom, you have 69% of the people holding 3% of the wealth. And in the middle, you have 23% of people with 14%. And basically, you have on the top 8, top 8% 8 with 42% of the wealth and top 1% with 41% of the wealth. So you have top 9% of the population is holding 83% of the wealth on this planet. How are you going to change that? You're not going to change that. This is just not going to happen. Well, how come some people are so rich? If you're one of those uh, rich Chinese, for example, uh, business owner, and you have a factory in China, and you have 50,000 workers working for you, of course you're going to be a super big billionaire. And all of the rest of them is just the way things are. I don't think we can ever change that in this world. I don't think... God is calling us to promote one form of government or another on this planet. I think God is calling us to do what we can do. <laughs> Jeff Bridges, an actor, says poverty is a very complicated issue, but feeding a child isn't. How true, isn't it? I can't solve the disparity in wealth in Hong Kong and New York City and you know you see people flying in their jets and driving off in their limos and you see others sleeping on the sidewalk. We cannot solve that as a church. Well, we can do one at a time. <clears throat> a guy came up to me this morning. He's not here right now. He was here in the morning service and he says hey um, did you get a phone call? And I said, no. And he said, well, you're going to get the phone call. And he told me what was going on. Somebody, a young person, living in the streets, a family member, wants to talk to somebody. And I, as I'm thinking about it, I'm wondering what can our church do to help one person get out of the streets, find a job, get an apartment, learn to take care of themselves. We are not going to solve that pyramid that we just saw. But maybe we can solve this girl's problem. Maybe we can help, give a helping hand. Maybe we can help a person who is struggling with alcohol to give it up. Or drugs, or any other vice. Maybe all they need is a church family. People that just care. So people ask me sometimes, Gordon, where are we going as a church? Well, that's where we're going. This is not complicated. This is not complicated. Yeah, we'll do all the other stuff. I'm all in favor of that. But this is not complicated. One person at a time. Maybe you know somebody that can use our help. Last text. Micah 8, 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? You and I came to church today. What did you bring for God today? 
Did you bring money? Did you bring a good character? Did you bring a visitor? Did you dress nice? Did you bring a little bit of repentance? In the Old Testament, when they went before God, they would bring gifts. They would bring offerings for the priesthood to live on. They would bring incense, and they would bring oils, and they would bring meat for the sacrifices, animals. And he says, Micah is such a tremendous prophet. He says, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God and I? I mean, the question is so, so deep. What can I bring that would please God? What can I bring into God's house, into his presence, that he would approve of? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? That's what they used to do. Burnt offerings on the altar. With calves a year old. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? With ten thousands of rivers of oil? I mean in our culture we would talk about money and cars and resources we bring to church, to God. Is this what he's going to be pleased with? How about this one? Shall I give my firstborn? What if I brought my child, my son, my firstborn son? In the Old Testament, son was more valuable than a daughter. So don't take this wrong. I'm just, I'm just reporting what they used to do. But when, they, when he wrote this, he meant a son. Firstborn son for my transgression. Even if the daughter, by the way, was born first and then the son, the son was considered to be a firstborn. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. What if I brought my child, my son or my daughter, the one that I love, and I gave them to God? Is that what's going to please God? And then he gives a, a simple formula for us to follow. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But, number one, to do justice. To do justice. To have integrity. To do what's right. To not take what doesn't belong to you. To not mess with other people's time and feelings and resources. And their humanity. To not take advantage of somebody. And we do that in so many ways. You don't have to cheat somebody out of money to take advantage of them. You can do injustice in so many ways. Husbands and wives doing injustice to each other for years and years and years. Abuse and cheating and all kinds of bad things. Students in a class. You can do injustice to yourself and to your professor when you cheat. He says, do justice. Love kindness. Do you remember that we have read already several verses in here where God says, do not let your heart harden? Yes. You remember, right? Love kindness. Why? Why? Because Jesus was kind. That's why I told you the message here today is we need to be like Jesus. It's not about money. It's not even about helping the poor. It's more than that. It's about being like Jesus. Do justice. Love kindness. Because Jesus was kind. You know that the Bible says that on several occasions, Jesus even teared up. Micah 6, what did I say? Micah 8. Okay, thank you. Micah 6. Is it Micah 6, 6 to 8? <laughs> okay, thank you so much for pointing that. I should have known that. I only studied for, I don't know how many years. 
but that's okay. <clears throat> so, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. I cannot overemphasize the kindness part. I really cannot overemphasize that. And I just want to take a, a minute here for each one of us to ask ourselves, is this who we are? Do I love justice? Most people will say, yeah, I'm a just person. I love justice. I love to do the right thing. But do you really? Have you been just to everybody around you? Kind? Well, that's, that's a difficult one. It's when we come up, with, come up with excuses, it's not easy to be kind to this person and to that person and to this person. They have different opinions and they are this way and they are that way. And why should I be kind to them? And to walk humbly with your God, to remember every day that this could be the day. <laughs> that all of our endeavors and plans and everything that we work for can end at any time. And to just humble ourselves before God. That's what God wants us to do. And I think as a church, we ought to do the same thing. Humbly walk with God. Be kind to other people. And look for projects where we can make a difference in this world. And that's what we are going to do here in the next, uh, for the rest of the year. A couple of other uh, statements here. Nelson Mandela, as long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality persist in our world, none of us can truly rest. And some people do because they just ignore that. They focus on themselves. And then the last one is from Einstein. The world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. So, what kind of a person are you going to be? What kind of a church are we going to be? That's a question. Hope you come back next week. God bless you. Thank you. Amen.